Um, just to sort of kick things off um, this evening, we are having an unusual uh, situation. We're having a sort of break from our normal schedule and we're trying this on a Friday night. Um, our sweat talk shop series has traditionally been held on the weekend. Uh, Sunday mornings, Japan time has been our, our go-to time slot this year. Um, but very happy to see a great turnout on a Friday night for 50 Sounds with Polly Barton. Um, in conversation with all of us, uh, Emily and myself as well, um, until nine o'clock tonight. Today, uh, we're so happy to welcome Polly Barton. Thank you so much for coming. And she's going to be talking about her latest publication, her memoir, 50 Sounds, uh, what, it, what it means to be a translator, how she became a translator, and her, her love of language. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of writing. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Lynn to introduce our guest tonight. Thank you, Susan, for your very capable hosting of our program. And I have to admit that I have not talked to Polly until this evening, but I have read her book and benefited from her wonderful story going back to her very early life when she came to Japan without knowing Japanese and really entered into the encounter with Japan and in the Butsuke Honban mode and uh, has brilliantly navigated through it as a writer and a uh, thinker and a translator. And she has evolved her career from English teacher as many of us began through many experiences and encounters and study and obviously a huge amount of effort, uh, which we can all read about in detail in her wonderfully articulate 50 sounds. And after leaving Japan or in between going back and forth, I believe, Polly also studied in university and acquired an MA in the theory and practice of translation, which even veterans like me, we don't have. <laughs> uh, a wonderful opportunity for those of you of the younger generation. And so I am really pleased that Emily Balustre has introduced us to you, Bali, and that we are able to talk with you today. So I'll let you do any further, <laughs> add any further details to that. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Um, and thanks to Emily for bringing me on here. Um, Polly's one of my favorite people in the whole world. So it's kind of natural that I would want to hear her tell us about her. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. Um, and it's really nice to, to be in this virtual space with you all. So I guess I'm going to begin with the reading. Yes, please. So 50 sounds for people who haven't read it. It's Kind of, I like to describe it as an essay in 50 essays and it kind of each, each of the essays making it up is, um, uh, yeah, so each of the, the chapters is um, structured around a particular word, onomatopoeic word, um, and they're all very different from one another and sort of when I'm asked to do readings I find it quite difficult to, um, I guess, find a sort of representative chapter. Um, so what I'm going to do today is actually just read out the chapter titles because each of the, the titles takes a very specific form where it's it's the, the Japanese onomatopoeic word followed by a very subjective slash incorrect personal definition of it which kind of relates to the, the contents of the chapter. And I think maybe read out together they sort of give some sense of of the kind of scope of the book um more than any of its kind of constituent parts can so 50 sounds you know the sound of eyes riveting deep into holes in your self-belief or vicariously visiting the nocturama or every party where you have to introduce yourself he's up he's up the sound of seeing what you thought was yours through the lens of an alternative system or of having your cock incomprehensibly suck. Zara zara, the sound of the rough, rough ground. 
mushy mushy. The sound of insects being forced from your body or laughing as you vocalize an unthinkable situation or being seen alive. Me, me. The sound of the air screaming or being saturated in sound. Sub buddy. The sound of a mind unblemished by understanding. Nobi nobi. The sound of space. Moja moja. The sound of electric hair. Yoti yoti. The sound of tottering at last. Zup. The sound of always and never having been like this. Metak tak. The sound of a truly mixed tool bag. Chira chira. The sound of the mighty loner and the caress of 10,000 ownerless looks. Jin jin. The sound of being touched for the very first time. Bota bota. The sound of red dripping onto asphalt. Kiki kiki. The sound of writing your obsession on a steamy tile or the miracle becoming transparent. Muka muka. The sound of nights with a dictionary and the thrill of drawing close to someone's real feelings. Hia hia. The sound of recalling your past misdemeanors. Dean dean. The sound of having lots of steps of dubitable quality. Bare bare. The sound of being so invested in something that it leaks into everything you do or abandoning hope of appearing cool or insidious paranoia. Pika pika. The sound of my flaws and your trainers and our graveyards. Jara jara. The sound of a flash of metal in the blood. Koro koro. The sound your teeny little identity makes as it goes spinning across the floor. Bishi bishi. The sound of being struck sharply and repeatedly by a stick-like object or infrequently of branches breaking. Mote mote. The sound of being a small town movie star. Pasa pasa. The sound of the desert heat in the heart or the desert heart in the heat. Bo. The sound of a ship leaving shore. Kira kira. The sound of a hashtag magic life or embracing your shining future. Shobo shobo. The sound of persistent drizzle on a 13th century Scottish castle. Chiku chiku. The sound of kicking against the pricks, or the ugliness of learning a language as a native English speaker, or the manner of stabbing repeatedly with a sharp pointed instrument. Giddy giddy. The sound of just about getting by, or being weighed on a moment by moment basis. The sound of stepping into a warm obliviousness that is probably not what a higher self would want or need. Giddy giddy. The sound of the small, sharp, dark, piercing feeling, or not loving anime as much as you should. Bada bada. The rattling sound the inexplicable makes as it becomes manifest. Sikuri. The sound of fitting where you don't fit. Hissori. The sound of being a masochist, or having an unrealizable unre dream of which you can't let go or subconsciously aspiring to a form of life governed by discipline, quietude, and an absence of sticky emotions. Peta, the sound of very sticky fingers. Pera pera, the sound of spouting forth or a bullish market. Ua, the sound of the feeling that cannot be spoken. Basari, the sound of progress. The sound of nevermore and how it comes when you least expect it. No, 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 no. The slippery sound of knowing the lingo. Uda, uda. The sound of the wild boar. Don. The sound of the sexy, lovely, violent hands slamming the wall. Don. The sound of big drums, bombs, and the good, bad dream. Uka, uka. The sound of always being slightly wrong. Boro, boro. The important sound of things falling apart. Sara, sara. The sound of a very smooth fluid taking you by surprise and being the most acceptable part of you. Hop. The sound of the xenophobe returning home or being restored to magical normality by your friends or tolerating yourself in photographs. Good tari. 
the sound of your words having more power than you thought or unexpectedly saying what you mean. Atsu atsu. The sound of being hot to a degree that stands just on the verge of acceptability. Uho ho. The sound of the jubilant gorilla and the foolish builder done good. Thank you. Um, since we just basically heard the structure of your book, um, I wanted to ask how you came up with the idea of organizing it around these kind of sound feelings. Um, if you thought of it first and then sketched things out from there, or were you writing and found yourself drawn to certain words? Um, how did it kind of come together for you? It was kind of a bit of both. So I came back to the UK from Japan, moved back to the UK maybe three and a half years ago. And I felt very much sort of between <laughs> between cultures, but also between languages. And I was finding myself thinking about Japanese um, and kind of having some quite intense thoughts about it and in a way that I hadn't, maybe hadn't whilst I was living there. Um, so I started writing some, some things about sort of language and me and my feelings about it. And that it was about various aspects, but the more that I wrote, the more the, I found these kind of onomatopoeic words kept popping up as, as things that I wanted to talk about but but more specifically like th that I would have like very specific memories attached to learning them or hearing them for the first time um and I so I was sort of writing and I didn't really know what I was writing and then around that time a friend forwarded me the um call out for the essay prize Fitzgeraldo editions essay prize um and I decided to enter, not really thinking that it would ever, anything would ever come of it, but more just because I, I wanted to try and um, consolidate my ideas, I suppose, and sort of work out what was possible for this stuff that I was writing. Um, and it, the, the kind of the call out, the call for applications, like very specifically says that um, they're looking for kind of ambitious experimental writing um and so I kind of sat down and started writing the proposal and also writing sounds and and, and the more that I I wrote the more this kind of idea came to me of, of this structure and at first it seemed like way too way too crazy you know that even now like when I try to describe it to people who haven't read it you know it, it ends up seeming so crazily sort of conceptual and 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 I kind of thought that it was a bit too much but then there was a part of me who was like well you know they've asked for ambitious and experimental so I'm gonna give it to them to see if they like it um and then I was given the prize and so then it was like oh god like now I really have to write this but you know um and I think like there were some there were some elements of the structure that were in place before. Like I knew that I it want I wanted it to follow a vaguely chronological kind of structure. Um, but even having said that, like there was a lot of back and forth thing in terms of like before it got to the final lineup and the final ordering that it is was printed in. Like there was yeah, but it. it there were a lot of insertions and deletions and, and I kind of had like a big, but at, at all times on my wall, there were, it was either like post-it notes showing the order of all the different sounds or like a, later on it was like a pin board. And yeah, so I, it took, that that was the hardest thing I would say was like juggling to, to, to get the right order. And also of course, to make sure that there were always 50, um, which was hard, um, yeah. And you spent part of that time in Italy, right? That was part of the prize? Yes, that was part of the prize. So um, part how of did the prize. that time work into your process of writing? So that was, we had to, I had to submit a sample um, mm -hmm. to, to enter the prize. And that was three chapters. But aside from that, I hadn't really written very much that I felt was usable. And Italy, I was there for three months and, um, like amazingly for once in my life, I managed to say no to all other work. I think just having that like structure 
and and kind of you know the feeling of like intense privilege of being there and enabled me to be like no actually I can't do this translation project because so anyway so I, I was just writing um which has not happened since or before um and essentially essentially produced a, a, a first draft I mean it wasn't complete and it underwent a lot of um permutations afterwards but I yeah I wrote about 70,000 words um, while I was there and Sounds that, like yes, that was, the ideal of what a residence sort of experience like that would be yeah nice. yeah it, it was I mean the first, yeah the first month was not very productive at all but then I think I kind of got into it and, and got into a routine and you know this is maybe a really cliche thing to say but I think up until then I'd always felt like writing was something that I had to essentially wait until I was in the mood for or like until the mood the muse kind of struck me and being in Italy really cured me of that notion I think that you know I could be like not feeling it in the mood or hungover or tired or whatever but you know all I really had to do the, <laughs> the only thing I was doing there was writing and so if I didn't write something every day I really felt like a, a bit of a failure so that that was yeah that was what I did and even if it was just a few lines I sort of made that rule to like yeah interact in some way with with it so I think that that really helped um I think also not having other stuff in the periphery and sort of you know I, I sometimes think that I wish in a way that this wasn't the case because it makes things quite difficult but for me I, I feel like translating and writing operate on quite different time scales like I, I would ideally need at least two weeks out of everything to sort of start writing and I need to not think about emails and I need to not you know whereas translation for me like I can do it in a relatively you know I know how much I'm going to do more or less in a week or whatever um but yeah sorry that was a bit rambly and off topic Oh, that's cool. Um, I was wondering if you had journals from your time in Japan that you were writing about or other times that you wrote about, because you're so specific and like the sharpness of your memories. Like, that was you know. my question. <laughs> I, actually, I actually pictured you writing this memoir and consulting a notebook that you had that you kept while you were in Japan with a list of onomatopoeia mimetic yeah. words and you re referenced that so nicely and I thought wow she must have had this all written down no actually no <laughs> not really at all like I when I first moved to Japan I kept this was the, the era of um live journal so I had like a live journal and like I referenced that a, I a bit but I think less than I thought I would I think for me there was something about that first year um which was just so like this it was just really extraordinary for me I think you know like it, in good and bad ways but like the intensity of it like not speaking you know going in only really being able to say how to name must it and then coming out kind of certainly not fluent but like more or less with a vague understanding of Japanese and you know and the kind of the ruralness of this island and it, it being constantly surrounded by people speaking, speaking Japanese and having this quite intense relationship and feeling very lonely and you know all, all of like all of it just meant that kind of so many of those episodes are just seared into my memory with this kind of degree of intensity that is not it isn't rivaled by anything else and and I struggled actually with the later stuff mm. um, to remember that so so clearly I didn't I didn't really have notes um it sort of made me wish that I had been like a, a dedicated journaler but I, I wouldn't yeah, my grandfather wrote a memoir, and but he had kept like very meticulous journals. Mm -hmm. So like when he wrote his memoir, it was like like specific to like what they ate and like what like really weird things. Yeah, um, but okay. Um, 
so in your book, there's tons of like super personal, really honest, raw stuff. And I'm wondering like, how did you decide what to share and how much did you worry about it? And does it do to think about worrying about it? <laughs> yeah, it's um, a really, it's a really good question. Because I've also dabbled in doing that kind of like personal essay thing on a much smaller scale. And now I don't ever want anyone to see it ever again. And I hope it's not possible to find. <laughs> so like rapidly um, starts Googling. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, um, uh, so this is something that I talk about a ton, obviously. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, I think like it, it's worth saying that it, there will inevitably, inevitably be people, in fact, I know that there are people because I've read what they've written online, who feel like I've, you know, shared too much, mm -hmm. um, either about myself or, uh, you know, that it's sort of irresponsible to share that amount of detail about other people, even though I, like, have done my best to kind of preserve the anonym anonymity of those people who I didn't get explicit consent to the book. Um, but I, I sort of think about, as I was writing it, I was aware of, well, I, I guess I was aware of two things. I was aware of like the people who have written memoir or kind of memoir adjacent fiction that I love. Um, and, you know, people like Maggie Nelson and Sheila Haiti and people like that and, and kind of almost without exception what I really appreciate is that kind of searing honesty um so that was that was one thing and then the other thing was um that I suppose I've read a lot of things written by white people who have been to Japan and come back or stayed there like predominantly men but not exclusively men mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, the, the kind of the jet memoir is not one that's lacking, right? We don't, we don't need any more of those. Um, but I, I feel like everything that they do, it, it, it tends to be rather one note for me, or at least like, which is not to say that's not those people's experiences, but like, for me, the, um, the thing about Japan was the kind of the all consumingness mm -hmm. of the learning and the kind of coming to understand things and the kind of bodily nature of it and like learning Japanese in that context, like learning Japanese in the classroom and learning Japanese like in the bedroom and learning Japanese while cooking and like all of the, there was no boundary between those. It was one sort of big overwhelming mess. And I, I felt like that was a, a facet of experience that I hadn't seen conveyed and so I, I guess I guess even though I knew it might make some people feel uncomfortable and even though I knew it was quite exposing like the book if it wasn't very honest was would be kind of nothing like that that like the honesty needed to was a kind of core element of it for me a kind of necessary condition of it for me um that said, like when I conceived of it, I didn't necessarily know which bits of my experiences would go in and which wouldn't. And there were, there was like definitely that is a, a balance issue. Um, you know, there's also, uh, sorry, just uh, uh, wrap, wrap up with this. But there's this funny thing of like, I felt really um, comfortable when I was writing it when I got to the end of it that I had like for me achieved that right balance and that I felt kind of that it was personal but I it was like well firstly like a presented experience rather you know a performed self rather than an actual self right and like I felt comfortable with that and also that it kind of, I felt like it worked and then that I was there with the like the file attachment you know and and ready to send it to my editor and I like I was supposed to be meeting a friend when I was in a cafe and I couldn't I was just watching the clock ticking and I couldn't press the send button and then I did and I felt like I was gonna be sick and 
you know, and then for like two weeks after that felt like really nauseous and really anxious. Like, so I guess, and, 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 and it's funny, like now I've come around again to being like, oh, that's fine. Like, yeah, you know, someone I really respect has read details of me having sex or whatever. Like, I mean, it fit, you know, I, I'm, I'm okay with that now, but, but at the beginning, like it, that was a process. And I think that's an interesting, that's an interesting thing of like when it's just you and your laptop, right? And of course, somewhere rationally, you know that this will be a book and maybe it will be different if I wrote another one, but because it's my first time and I've never really had my words published in that way, except as a translator, like that, yeah, it suddenly becomes quite grippingly real and terrible. I'm gonna ask one more question and then I'm gonna let Susan ask a bunch of questions, but, um... Part of what I like about this book is that it brings together all of these things that you're super competent in and like the writing and also your Japanese knowledge. And then also all of this stuff about Wittgenstein um, that I loved because I think vaguely I knew that you had studied philosophy, but I didn't know about this sort of like, I mean, I felt like he was almost like a philosophy dad throughout the book or something. And uh, so I'm just... Uh, I'm wondering if there's a starting place or a route that you recommend for people who want to become more familiar with his work. My book? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is a really difficult one because I think one of the things that is so magical about Wittgenstein is like the, the actual experience of reading his prose, right? Like mm -hmm. it, it's so idiosyncratic and it's so, like just as prose, it's so such a specific kind of taste and texture and I, and I love that but at the same time like if you approach it just just approach that without any kind of secondary text I think it, it, it can be quite overwhelming and quite hard to figure out what's going on I there's a book um which I will put in the chat called um the the duty of genius um I think it's Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein, The Duty of Genius by Ray Monk. And it's um, it's a biography, but it also mm. is a really good starting point to um, his philosophy as well, I think. Um, you know, I, it, until now, I think most, most books about Wittgenstein tend to be either about him as a man or about him, his philosophy. And I think this does a really good job of combining the two um and it you know the other thing is like he is such a fascinating person even even like if you have no interest in philosophy at all like just his life is really extraordinary um and and I think it's really beautifully written um I, it's the sort of book that I mean I'm I am a little bit geeky when it comes to Wittgenstein but honestly I get to the end and I just want to kind of turn back to page one because it's yeah it's really great yeah I knew this was a good question to ask okay <laughs> <laughs> thank you um, that's exciting more books to read yeah I just posted a link in the in the chat to the book you mentioned oh so, amazing I was just painstakingly typing it out there yes thank you that's yes that's <laughs> I'll, I'll put the title link just just because I typed yeah excellent thank you thank you What's on your mind, Susan? Okay, well, I don't want to cut you off, but I was really interested in your uh, progression as a linguist um, as I read this, because I think that all of us have come to the Japanese language in different ways. Um, some of us, you know, had our first taste of Japanese when we went to college and we took a class in Japanese. Some people had immersion courses in high school or, or middle school. Um, and many of us, as you did, have came to Japan cold with no knowledge of Japanese. And um, for many of us, it was, it sparked something, uh, something huge, it sparked right change in our lives and sort of sent us down a path that maybe we weren't expecting. I consider myself to be a member of that group as well. I did not come on jet, but a, a very similar sort of situation. I'm wondering if you feel like there's any distinct advantage to uh, coming to a language that way. 
coming to a language cold and being immersed in the language rather than having starting out with the formal study of language. I mean, the quick answer is yes. <laughs> I do feel like there is, but I ne can't necessarily back that up. Like, I don't know. My sense is probably my Japanese is not as good as someone who would, who did, you know, someone who studied formally in a university or like, you know, that this is something I go into a little bit in the book, but like occasionally there are, I guess less and less, but still like I find like these gaps. It's like, oh wow, that has just never cropped up before. Um, and I suppose that's the experience of everyone, but I think, you know, university education does tend to give you slightly more of a kind of comprehensive spread. Um, I, I think for me, the advantage was, you know, kind of linked to what I was saying about the, um, the kind of vividness and the intensity of, of that first year and the way that it it really felt like an adventure, you know, in a way that was so like my my university experience was so kind of um mediated and everything felt quite kind of crusty and suddenly being in this place where it was like wow you know it, it really was like a kind of struggle for survival in some way or like a kind of real life computer game where you know that more I'd have to go to the post office that afternoon so like I desperately memorize these sentences in the morning and then go down there and like get to put them into practice and like mess up a little bit but still manage to get it across and like and that and yeah it, that was really an extraordinary experience for me I think like it, it's hard to underestimate how when you're like how nerve-wracking and rewarding and kind of humiliating and everything that is when you are 21 and you know oh, I don't know yeah very little experience of kind of other places I suppose um and I think yeah so I think for me that wasn't necessarily um I can't say whether or not that was linked to um becoming better at Japanese but I think what it was definitely linked to was this feeling of like falling in love with the language and that motivation like that kind of locked in directly to like this motivation of really wanting just to keep going you know and I think um I still have that you know I still I still want to learn I like I still feel that sense of kind of love maybe not as much as someone like Emily who's like <laughs> never ending love but Japanese really kind of puts me to shame, but 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 yeah, still to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. I feel like. That was one of the things when I was reading it, though, is like we're total opposites. Like I was like, I knew from before I chose Japanese that I wanted to be a translator. So then I had to pick a language and then I had to study Japanese. And then so by the time I got here, I could function halfway decently. It was still a thing. But okay. it just struck me like so Polly's experience is one that you can only have if you do it that way. Like I can't go back and feel that sense unless I, you know, Move to Korea, I guess, or something. But I mean, what's the chance of that happening? Very slim. <laughs> I think my experience was a little bit more similar to Polly's in that um, I remember, I'm older now, but I still remember that feeling of um, extreme fatigue at the end of each day because it was such a mental effort to get through each day in Japanese when there was no English available, no one around me spoke English. And it was, it, it was invigorating, but it was also extremely tiring. I just remember being so exhausted at the end of each day. So yeah, I really, I really connected with your experience. I had, I had a very similar, similar experience um, to you. Um, I, connected I, can, I can say that you yeah. know, 40 years ago, I had the same experience. <laughs> so, 25 years ago. This is fans the generations. Um, yeah, yeah. Because I was also 20. And, and I know Julie Kuma was 20, 19, and many of us. So 
But you have, what I wanted to say to Polly is that not many of us have been able to put it into words. Um, and I think most of us are extremely grateful that you um, have been able to uh, do the, do the language um, to articulate it for us. Yeah, that's all. Oh, let's go back to you, Sue. Oh, no, that's okay. Sorry, Polly, go ahead, sorry. No, 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 I was just saying thank you. That's really nice to hear. And yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Like, it, in a way, the book is really just about that experience of learning a language. Right, which it sort of seems like such an insanely basic <laughs> concept for a book that I'm kind of surprised that there aren't more memoirs like that. But it, like, I, I don't know that many. Um, and, and maybe maybe it's something to do with the kind of, I don't know, you know, maybe maybe part of the intensity comes from it being Japan, or at least being a language with a different writing system and kind of very different, you know, paralinguistics and all of that is kind of different and 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 possibly, you know, going to France and learning French from scratch wouldn't have quite the same like world shattering, I don't know, feeling to it that would make someone want to write. But I think another thing, if I can just interject, is that you did it when the experience was most vivid for you. Yeah. And many of us have lost that opportunity. Exactly. So we have had very vivid experiences, but uh, either we were busy with child care or, or work or something which interrupted that opportunity, and then decades passed. I see yeah. many faces here of people who could write memoirs, but I myself have missed the opportunity uh, until now. So it's wonderful that you took that opportunity. Yeah, yeah, really good time. I, I was just mentioning just before you got to the meeting, actually, Polly, that it's amazing that you wrote this at your age. I don't know your exact age, but it's younger than me, I'm sure. Um, but, no, um, no, no, no. I think, I think of people writing a memoir when they're, you know, my grandfather also wrote his memoir, but he was, he was like 89 years old or something. And people usually, you know, it's a time at a time of life when people can reflect, but the, the danger is that if you don't have those journals or those notes or any kind of writing to document, then you forget. I mean, that's just part of, part of growing old and part of, part of life. So I'm really grateful that you wrote this at this stage of your life. And I want you to write another memoir in about 30 <laughs> years <laughs> so that you can continue this, this, this reflection. I, I really look forward to that. Okay. Yeah, I would like to ask um, in one of the chapters, and I'm sorry, I don't remember which chapter it was, you talked about the, um, this idea that I have often felt as well. And that is that I am a different person when I speak Japanese or when I'm communicating in Japanese. Not only do I, I, I I'm just not myself. I'm not <laughs> in, in many ways. I mean, not just the way I speak, my register goes up when I speak Japanese, I don't speak in a low voice. Um, and I, I, my personality changes and I was kind of surprised to see you articulate that as well. Maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but would you mind talking about that a little bit? Yeah, not at all. Um, I mean, it's such an interesting body of questions, I think, around this. Um, so that the chapter in particular kind of delves into this research that it, 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 I, I don't do much kind of analysis of linguistics research and in the book, but this is one where I kind of touch upon um, the studies that have been done into kind of essentially multiple personalities that are had by speakers of um, different languages. Um, and the, um, in particular, it's this, this study that um, was carried out on um, women of Japanese heritage, native Japanese, speakers living in the Bay Area um, and um, 
asking it's a sentence completion exercise um so the, uh, the, the sentences would begin something like when i when i am older i want to be a blah 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 or um the most important quality in a friend is to be blah 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 um and the answers were just to totally different um so you know in Japanese, when I when I am older, I want to be a housewife. In English, when I am older, I want to be a teacher. Um, and and the, the the chapter just kind of explores that in connection with like my feelings of yeah, feeling like a different person and sort of um, having people comment often like this happened particularly early in my kind of linguistic exploration where I suppose like you sound totally different when you speak Japanese or you have a totally different personality um you're really threatening when you speak English and you're really cute when you speak Japanese and why is there such a disparity and don't you feel weird about that and you know like some quite like things questions that I found quite kind of confrontational even though like I had been thinking about those things exactly myself but like to you know have them brought to you kind of by someone else I think it's, it's quite um Fronting. I think so Susan you were saying like that that your experience is sometimes like when you're speaking Japanese that like, you feel like or well, the thought formulates itself like this is not me and I think that's really interesting because I think definitely I felt that or I do feel that sometimes and then sometimes the thought is just like this is a different me you know like and and sort of it, obviously in the beginning like the, the English me had this had primacy and then I think like the more that you are immersed in Japanese society and the language maybe maybe they they don't you know one ceases to have primacy right and it can be just like switching between different different personalities or or something like that I, like the research that has been done with um people who grow up with multiple languages seems to suggest that that is how it feels for them you know that it, it it's not neither neither kind of english self or french self or english self or japanese self is 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 the self it's just they are different they are necessarily different kind of ways of expressing themselves um it's i mean yeah it's it's such an interesting and complex um range of questions I feel like and it kind of almost deserves a book to itself in a way um but I don't think I'm the one to write it <laughs> <laughs> I'm no. annoyed that I haven't gotten further in um Keiichiro Hirano's book about the self it's literally like watashi to wa ka and it's about wow. kind of redefining um he goes from individual to a word in um minus the in just individual so it's about like there's no of your network of cells and like and all I've read is the introduction so far so that's all I can say but it seems really interesting and now I'm curious if he brings up that issue of different languages um I was also just gonna add like for me I notice especially on Twitter because I have two accounts that like the things that I feel like expressing in Japanese are oftentimes different things from what I feel like expressing in English even though I tweet overwhelmingly in English most of the time like there are certain feelings that I'd just rather share in Japanese than in English, which, um, and other than that, I feel like also, um, partly for me specifically, it's probably about um, gender presentation, um, but I feel like I really kind of actively tried not to change too much when I s spoke Japanese. Like I would try to really resist like my voice popping up or things like that because I was just like no I want to be myself <laughs> like I don't want to be what people think I should be or and it was like but it's hard you know because you're mimicking everyone around you so sometimes you catch yourself and you're like oh well okay yeah that's something that I've actually made a conscious effort mm -hmm. with Japanese is like at, at the beginning I think my voice did go really high and I think I've been trying to sort of bring it bring it down <laughs> I, and also trying to bring my English voice down as well um, <laughs> um 
I was, yeah, I was listening to a podcast the other day we were talking about how, um, I mean, this is also to do with kind of the gender presentation and, and ways in, in the, the extent to which you're taken seriously, but just speaking lower, like massively affects how seriously people take you, which is why, like, if you listen to, so Margaret Thatcher famously, like, had voice lowering lessons and if you listen to her like from when she was just about to be elected prime minister to like 10 years later it's like huge differences anyway yeah the tone of voice really does really does make a big difference and it's something that i had to work on as well i i did radio back in in college and and afterwards and that was the first thing that they said we've got to work you've got to work on this you sound like a 12 year old and they made me <laughs> they made me record myself every time and listen to myself and that was it was horrible i mean it's terrible to have to listen to yourself sounding like an idiot so um, yeah, yeah, it, <laughs> it's something I'm very conscious of as well. And I, I try not to let myself get way up there in Japanese either. Okay, um, I, have a, I have a couple more questions. One of them has to do with the word fluency and, and the big question, are you fluent in Japanese? And this is something that you, you also brought up in your book. Um, and it, I think that's probably a question that many of us um, in this group have probably received over the years. Every single one of us. Are you fluent in Japanese? <laughs> oh, you're so fluent. And, you know, what, what, what does that mean? And <laughs> do you consider yourself to be fluent? Because like you said, I'm still learning new words and new constructions and new Japanese daily. So how about you? Are you fluent, Polly? Like, and also, sorry, that it's so I can answer this one. That it's so contextual, right? Like I can be with someone and feel like, wow, I am just saying everything that I want to say. And obviously it's not perfect, but like I, I, I you know, there's no kind of obstructions. And then, I mean, this certainly happened when I was in Japan. Like the very same day I would go to a bank or something and speak to someone who like obviously barely trusted that I could utter a single word in Japanese and I would find like in reaction to that my fluent, fluency levels just drop and you know I, and I would also feel like a 12 year old but yeah in a different way um so I feel like it's hugely contextually dependent I so after I'd written this book, or after I'd written this chapter, I, think, I was speaking to someone who, oh yeah, that was it, that was it. My friend was over from Japan and the two of us met this person. Um, and he basically wanted to ask the question of, are you fluent? Um, but what he said was, are you loosely fluent? And both of us, like me and my friend, looked at one another and it's like, wow, because just by adding that word, it, it, it sort of, it feels really different to admit, to say, yeah, yeah, I'm loosely fluent. Then to, to say, yes, I'm fluent, kind of, I don't know, even, even if you conduct your life entirely in Japanese, I think unless you are essentially a native speaker or a native level speaker, indistinguishable from a native speaker, there's this, at least in English, like this implied arrogance to just saying of yourself, I am fluent, even if you would say exactly the same thing of someone else who was exactly your level, you know? Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that kind of answers the question. I have yeah, I have a big problem with this with this word, and I think we we all we suffer with it, right? Of, we do. Um, and 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 sort of I don't know. Like I remember being teased at school. But, sorry, at at the Japanese school where I was working for the first year. That you know, when I 
would say a single word or something that I just learned and uh, back at this stage was definitely not fluent you know it would be like oh you're so fluent in Japanese and I think after having heard that like then I, I you know that was the beginning of like developing this quite difficult relationship with any any concept of fluency okay yeah. we'll just call you pera pera then we'll just say you're <laughs> <laughs> we'll avoid the the key word of fluency yeah I I try to avoid that as well and I don't feel like I'm fluent either. Um, and my my husband and son are both native Japanese and English speakers, both of them. They're so lucky. Um, <laughs> but, and I would consider both of them to be fluent, but I myself uh, am not. So yeah, I, I don't claim that title either. Um, I, I have a question. Um, I'm, you can tell I'm really focused on language and linguistics and I teach translation. So I was really focused on your, your language progression and, and how you're working as a translator. And right now you're living, I, well, first of all, my first question is I read your memoir and I have a question as to how, about how many years did you live in Japan um, before going back to the UK to study translation? A year and a half. A year and oh, just a year and a half. Oh my gosh. Okay, it took up a lot more space than that in the book. So I thought yes. it was about yes, totally. five years. Wow. Okay, that's it. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So then I went back, worked. So it's all. Yeah. I mean, essentially, from that point onwards, I would say um, my life was relatively like focused around Japanese. So I worked for a year in a company. Um, like a publishing company where I was the only non-Japanese mm -hmm, mm -hmm. person so it was kind of it was on it was very strange it was like based just off Oxford Street in London but like you would step in and it was suddenly like being in Tokyo um and it, you know everything like I was in Tokyo essentially um anyway so yes yeah, so then I did various things and then I, I worked for Nintendo for a while and then I um went back to Japan and that's that was the longer stint so like, it, it, and you don't necessarily know that from the book or like at, at times the chronology was more clear and then I kind of realized that actually that there wasn't much meaning to kind of having it so people could work out the chronology um okay okay yeah so, so in total I guess I've been there about six years um not a huge amount yeah that that's that's not very long at all actually it's it's impressive that you that you got as much as you did from the short period that you were here. And it leads me to my next question. And that is, um, as translators, um, if, we're, if you're working on this side of things, doing J to E translation, our biggest challenge is keeping up with English, is keeping up with the latest, um, the latest language and the latest trends in our native language so that we can translate well into English. Um, but for you, you're you're on the opposite side of things. You're English. You're you're in an English environment right now, so you're naturally being exposed to the latest English. But what about your Japanese? How are you? How are you keeping up with your Japanese? Yeah, I mean, not very well. I think <laughs> it's the answer. Um, you know, I I am a full time translator, so I and and I would say like what I translate is quite varied. So I feel like I, I, I keep up with the written stuff. Um, but just last week, actually, I was um, tutoring on a, a summer school, translation summer school, um, with Shivasa Tupomoka as the kind of guest, guest author. Yeah. Um, and she, she doesn't really have much English. So although it was like primarily carried out in in um in English there was a lot of Japanese as well and that sort of really brought it home to me how much like I you know I have friends in Japan who I chat with on Skype in Japanese but that's very kind of a specific um informal kind of Japanese where I feel quite comfortable I think and you know kind of doing this stuff like in a formal capacity but also especially like with with the kind of te you know teacher cap on and the kind of all the pressures that that brings with it at least for me I, yeah it made me really think my goodness me I really need to um 
yeah up my game a little bit in this but it, but it's hard and you know one of the things that I set, set out to do when I left um Japan three years ago was to go back like to kind of promise myself to go back for like a decent chunk every year um but of course kind of corona has made that very difficult um yeah. so yeah it's 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 surprisingly difficult I've started listening to more Japanese audiobooks um <laughs> desperate attempt um to get some content but yeah it's it's not it's not easy I'd okay. say can I ask a question related to that do you have someone that you work with a Japanese um who's interested in translation or literature that you, you can regularly can ask questions or consult? yeah yeah I do I have friends who I can kind of ask questions but I, I'd say at the moment I don't have like one particular go-to person and I sometimes think that would be nice you know especially like if it was a mutual arrangement and ideally they would be a you know ETJ translator and we can kind of swap but at the moment I don't I don't have that yeah it's it's okay. wonderful to have a collaborator I have I highly recommend it I've worked for 40 years with a collaborator and you learn so much about things you don't even think you know or that you don't realize you don't know. And so, especially if you could, but your spectrum is so wide between nonfiction and fiction that it might be hard to find someone in the <laughs> place where you really need them. Thank you. Thank you. I have several different collaborators. <laughs> okay, um, we're just about at the halfway point. Uh, so I'd like to take a five minute break. I'd also like um, our participants to think about an onomatopoeia or mimetic word in Japanese that you particularly like. And if you'd like to share that with us after the break, that would be great. You can pop it in the chat or you can unmute your microphone when we come back and share your favorite mimetic or onomatopoeia word. Okay, thanks everyone. We'll come back in five minutes. Okay, welcome back everyone. I'd like to open things up to questions from um, our participants tonight. If you'd like to uh, raise your hand. I can call on you. I cannot see all of your screens, though, so it might be easier to pop your question into the chat. Um, but uh, I'm happy to take your questions either way for Polly. Beverly, sure. Go ahead. Hi, Polly. Thank you for it was great listening to you. At the very beginning, you said something that about the difference between creative writing. In fact, it's been, it's kind of come up a couple of times, the difference between translating and creative writing. And one of the things in my classes is I really follow the um, Adriana Rich spectrum, you know, that, that these are all on the writing spectrum. And I, I wondered, your story is as much, a, it's a story of translation. It's a memoir of translation. And what you said early, which I was kind of surprised to hear, was that you had separated creative writing with your life as a translator. And to me, they seem to be, as I said, on the spectrum. Could you talk about their relationship in your life? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, basically, in essence, I absolutely agree with you. You know, I, I, I do think it's a spectrum and I don't, you know, I. Ultimately, I think in order to be a good translator, you have to be a very good writer as well as a very attentive and empathetic reader. And so what I said earlier wasn't kind of intended to imply in any way that like, I see them as that different as a skill set, but I suppose you know, maybe maybe it's this. Maybe it's the sense that um, when you're translate, when I'm translating, when one is translating, one has the the stimulus right there, right? Like that's the, the world is 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 waiting there for you. And I feel like, I mean, of course, if I'm really distracted, then that doesn't happen. But most days, you know, I can just open up the book or open up the the word file, and I'm right there. And I think when you're writing, that has to come from you, I suppose, and it, it, it takes me a while to, to get to that point where I'm, you know, where I feel like I can really um, engage with 
the, I mean, in this case, with, with the memories, but also with the kind of, you know, more generally with the, the kind of the thoughts and the feelings and, or, and all of that stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I wish that I was the kind of person who could just like sit down and switch that on. And sometimes it happens, but I think my ideal way to do that and the way that I like tend to produce the best stuff is, is when I don't have to be kind of, I haven't got a to-do list, you know, and I, whereas I find with translating, it's much more compatible with a to-do list and I can just set aside a couple of hours and then do it. Okay, thank you. We have several questions that have come in on the chat. So I'm just going to go in the order in which they're received. So Suzanne Kamada has asked, what are you working on now? And what will your next book be? I don't know whether that's translation or other creative writing. I'm actually working at the moment on a manga translation, which is my first ever. Um, and it's really great. And I think from now on, I might just translate manga. No. It's, yeah, it, that that's, feels like doing something really new and it's really fun. Um, it's been a weird few months, actually, um, because I feel like, you know, with the launch of the book and and things, like I, I, I've, I've had work to do, but it, it, I haven't had any kind of big meaty projects for a while. Um, and so I'm just, I'm just kind of getting back to that. Now I've got a, a couple of translation things on the pipe on the in the pipeline. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I suppose the next book that will come out that I've been involved with is um, a book that I actually got a Penheim grant to translate five years ago, um, and did translate five years ago, but it's sort of taken that long to like find a publisher and so on and so forth. So um, that's finally coming out this August from Skyhorse and it's um, um, Kubo Misumi's Urai Nai Boku Wa Sora Onza, which is coming out in English as um, So We Look to the Sky. Um, and that's a really amazing book, which I think deserves to be widely read. So that's, that's quite exciting. That's exciting. That's exciting. That's huge. But five years? Wow. No, I know. Um, I think, yeah, we, I mean, I could bore you and I won't, but like, it's a very specific set of issues with that book that means that like, it's made been kind of uniquely difficult to find a, a publisher for. Um, well, I mean, I say uniquely, maybe not uniquely, you know, because even after this long kind of dealing with publishers, it's still remains slightly opaque to me what it is about a book that makes some publishers so excited and then you know other books that like they seem to mean the most exciting things in the world and publishers are just you know yeah. next so I yeah I don't I don't really understand the algorithm but it seems there is one in some interesting are you able to share the title of the manga that you're working on or is that is that to be announced it's a good question, actually. I don't think that I am. Okay. But it's a minor work by Isabel Summit. So that's quite okay. exciting. Good. I will okay. I'll let you know when it when it when it's been announced. Sure, sure. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Um, the next question from Angela is, did you ever consult the dictionary meanings of the onomatopoeia? And if so, were you influenced by those in any way? Or did you try to understand them entirely through your own experience from the start? I very much consulted the dictionary definitions. Um, so I had, I think I owned three Japanese Yongo Taigo Jisho. And then I also have, I also found online on Google Books, like an English version. So someone has sort of made a dictionary translating of how to translate, or no, often it's not translation, but explanations of Yongo you know, and Kitaibo. And actually a couple of the, just a couple of the definitions directly quote those English definitions. Um, and that was that was really important to me. I mean, I obviously the different the definitions that I give are subjective and often wrong. 
but I I wanted to be aware where they're wrong you know like I I I didn't want to say anything I, I think when you read if and when you read the book like it becomes relatively clear that um I hope it becomes relatively clear that I'm not sort of purporting to give a correct definition right and 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 I wanted to make sure that when I talked about what the Japanese actually means in a in a community-wide sense that what I was saying was correct so yeah the, the, the research was definitely an important aspect of that Okay, thank you. That was something I noticed as well. You even referred to that in the book. You you mentioned looking up different words and what the dictionary said when you looked it up and certain words didn't have definitions. They just had example sentences. And sometimes that was really frustrating. Um, yeah, I find that I, I have the same frustration sometimes. Um, but it's really, it also reminded me, sorry to go off to be personal here, but it reminded me of the fact that when I, um, when I was first starting out, I sort of had this feeling that if I were a real translator, I wouldn't be consulting the dictionary so much. I wouldn't need to. I should be more fluent than that. We've already discussed fluency, but I was very happy to see that you generously used your your dictionary um, often, as as we all know, that's a that's a really important part of our of our job. Um, it's like a fascinating misconception that isn't it? Because I think I had exactly the same one. I'm like, oh, there will come a point when I will never even touch the dictionary. Like, I don't I don't think that makes you a, you know a, either a good speaker or a good translator. I don't really yeah, but like. You know, I, I look at the dictionary in English a lot, right? Exactly. That's, that's part of the deal. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm um, very happy to hear that because there were tr young translators in one period who would boast that they didn't have to use a dictionary. They already knew. And I think it may be a product of uh, some era of American Japanese language education when using a dictionary was apparently not considered a good thing and translating itself was denigrated. And I was very sad to, to hear about that era. I think it may have passed. I hope it had passed. <laughs> I hope so, I hope so. Yeah, thank you. Um, Victoria asks, um, she says, I heard earlier about the essay prize, which seems to have been the catalyst for writing this book. Um, but what did you really want to convey with this book? Can we simply take it as a memoir that you linked up with Onomatopoeia or was there something else you wanted to get out there for readers to pick up on? I don't really know what I wanted to convey with this book. Um, and that's kind of why I wrote it. You know, like I, I feel like if I could have, if I could say relatively succinctly what I wanted to convey, then I wouldn't have needed to write this book in a sense. Um, in another sense, I never really conceived of it as a memoir. And I, you know, I know that the, the, our definition as a society of memoir is changing. And like Susan was saying earlier, like, you know, it used to have this thing, this connotation of like, it's something you write towards the end of your life and, you know, almost like an autobiography. And I think we're moving away from that, but I still, you know, I remember the slight discomfort that I felt when, the publisher first described it as a memoir to me. It's like, oh gosh, is that what I'm writing? I mean, I, I guess it is, but I, like I've never felt truly at home with that label, I suppose, because it, it does bring in other aspects. I suppose maybe what I really wanted to convey in some way was kind of what I was, saying before about the experience of learning language on the ground as opposed to in an in educational institution or in a textbook um, and how and, and what a sort of emotionally overwhelming and enriching and sometimes frustrating and humiliating experience it is I, I you know it that feeling of it being like a, a real actual adventure that you're sort of living through. I think, uh, yeah, that that in a way was sort of at the core of the book. And, and, and the way that that experience is, to my mind at least, like not really 
what we think or talk about when we think or talk about language learning, despite the fact that so many people do actually undergo that at, at some point, you know, um, and then, but then often like sort of forget about it because, or not forget about it, but it's almost like the, all that stuff that happens isn't for public consumption. So it should be just kind of put away in the, in the memory box. And I guess I wanted to sort of explode my memory box and then ho hopefully like invite other people to explode their own in some sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could definitely relate to it. And um, I think that I, I don't imagine everyone in this group has had the chance to read your book yet. It's just come out and it's not easily available at the moment, especially if you want a physical copy. Um, I, I did get it on Kindle, but I wasn't able to get a physical hard copy of the book yet. Um, yeah. Angela, yeah, sorry, Angela mentions here in the chat, you know, she's sorry, I haven't read it yet. It's really hard to get the book at the moment. Yeah, in, it is in Japan. And I don't know what I, I genuinely have no understanding of why that is the case. My sense is that it's some kind of suspicious policy on Amazon's behalf, because you know, the, the it was released in like April and from the very beginning they've kind of announced that it will be available in Japan in September, which makes absolutely no sense to me. Um, but that's where we are. Yeah. You can order it directly from the publisher and they will ship to Japan, but I understand that that's not, not great. Um, yeah, so, sorry. yeah, so no worries to Angela or anyone else who's had trouble getting their hands on the book. Don't worry about it. Um, but one delightful surprise I did find when I was reading it is that um, unlike a lot of other memoirs or books of this type, essay type books, um, I was really pleased to see that um, Polly included uh, references at the end. She refers to several different uh, studies that were done or different dictionaries, that sort of thing, different references that she used in her writing and she lists them all at the end, which is fabulous for those of us who do like to read further into some of the topics that she was talking about. So there's something to look forward to. Uh, don't miss the references at the end. Um, there's a question here from Marion. Uh, did you imagine a target reader as you wrote? Did you need to adjust for readers that have no experience related to Japan? That was a really, it's a really great question. And so that was really hard with this book. Um, because, you know, I, I think this is, it, I knew from the beginning that it was as, before I started to write it, that it was going to be published by Fitzgeraldo, um, who, you know, this is their first sort of Japan related book that they've done. Um, I also knew that like being about Japan and Japanese, it would likely attract, you know, the people who would be sort of running out to get it were people with a, pre-existing interest in Japan but at the same time I wanted it to be accessible to people who didn't speak didn't have any Japanese or really have any knowledge um so it, yeah it was it it was um tricky I think you know in a way that the, the kind of chronological structure of it helped me with that because I was describing this journey from myself knowing nothing at all to knowing a fair bit and so kind of by taking the reader on that journey it's like at the beginning I wasn't insulted if it was even if it is a reader who knew everything about Japanese I was by describing myself and what I didn't know I wasn't insulting their intelligence and then by the end it was kind of I hope that he could have like brought even people who didn't know things up to speed in some way um I mean, yeah, how much like, how much detail to go into is still, was still like a, um, yeah, a, a difficult decision process. Although that was, that was one area where my editors were really helpful and actually like, you know, it, one respect in which having an editor who knew nothing about Japanese was very helpful. Um, because there were bits which I hadn't even like clocked would not be comprehensible and it's like wow what's going on here and so then you know we would have to kind of unpack things um yeah 
it didn't seem um, coming for me reading it, it. It didn't seem dumbed down in any way. It didn't seem overly, um, you know, explanatory, having to explain the Japanese language and that sort of. It wasn't pedantic in any way. Um, so it was, I, I think you struck a really nice balance, and and good for you, and good for your editor, <laughs> who spotted those places that that might have uh, tripped up someone who isn't familiar with Japanese. Yeah. Um, Avery asks, um, she says, I really appreciate how 50 Sounds conveys the full on experience of learning a language highly unlike one's own, which I constantly struggle to describe to mainly English speakers. Do you know of any other books or pieces of writing that similarly convey this experience vividly uh, with which 50 Sounds might be in conversation in some respects? I don't really, um, which is kind of why I felt like I wanted to write it. But I mean, the one book that I would um, say that it's, it definitely is in conversation with, um, and but it, it isn't really about Japanese, it's more, more about translation and specifically French, is This Little Art by Kate Briggs. Um, oh, that's just appeared in the chat. Just oh, I was just going to say that just appeared like <laughs> magic when you said it in the chat. Thank you, Beverly. <laughs> Thanks, Beverly. That saved me having to sit back. Um, and, and that actually, so that also is a Fitzcarraldo book. And I think that that was a big, um, yeah, a big moment for me in, in kind of allowing myself allowing myself to believe that I could write 50 sounds in the beginning, but but secondly, allowing myself to believe that it would be interesting to anybody else, you know, because this little art really goes into the minutiae of translating. So it, it, the author, Kate Briggs, is a French translator and he's translating Roland Barthes' last lectures and she kind of takes you through the process of that with, with various details. Um, and I found it really gripping and really, and I, I sort of didn't trust myself to, to um, believe that it would be gripping for everyone. But then I had plenty of friends, it actually was given to me by a friend who's not a translator. It's a mon um, English speaker with no other languages. And she was just fascinated by it. And, and that kind of was the first time I think that I thought like, wait, if you approach something with sufficient passion um, and, and that, manages to find its way into your writing probably anything can be fascinating to people who don't know about that that subject if it's done in the right way um so yeah i think i think kate brings his this is law is is yeah the, the only thing that i can think of that for me was at the back of my mind when i was writing it okay um emily you just posted a link to another book can you tell us what that is Oh yeah, I, I mean, I haven't read it yet, but I'm kind of curious now because it appears to be, um, it's called Dreaming in Hindi, Coming Awake in Another Language by Catherine Russell Rich. Um, and it sounds like she kind of does a similar thing. She spontaneously accepts a freelance writing assignment to go to India. And then she's so thunderstruck by the place in the language that she's decided to go learn Hindi. And like, so it could be, similar in that sense where she kind of is on the ground wow. without much prior knowledge yeah i'm gonna order that i think <laughs> <laughs> looks good just to let everyone in the in the um group know that you can save the chat the chat has a lot of good links in it right now that people have posted you can click on the three dots the button with the three dots in your chat and it gives you a menu, a pop-up menu, and you can click on save chat. And at the end of the meeting, when the meeting is over, it will automatically be saved to your computer. So you don't have to busily try to copy and paste all of these comments from the chat right now. Um, okay, getting back to other questions. You were just talking about uh, the helpfulness of your editor and pointing out things that 
uh, perhaps would be incomprehensible to someone who doesn't know Japanese. And Lynn writes that many of us in this group are editors, so we're curious about how much editing you did to your manuscript and what sort of things your editor also pointed out to you that needed adjustment and how much time it took in editing. I think that's three questions, Lynn. <laughs> you reached your quota. Okay. I, I think I can only remember the second two. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, no, I can find it. Many of us are editors, so we're curious about how much editing we did to manuscript. What did that? Yeah. Um, I did a lot of editing in my manuscript. Um, but then I sort of, you know, it's weird, right? But when you are the author of something, then it sort of almost by definition isn't editing or. I, I don't know, it, it was the editing stage, but I didn't see myself as an editor because I suppose for me, an editor is like necessarily someone who has a different perspective on it. So I felt, to me, it was just kind of getting it in a submittable state. Um, and then I, um, yeah, sent it to my editor at Fitzcarraldo. I also actually um, sent it to my brother and he ended up doing a very thorough edit of it as well. Um, I would say the editing process was pretty quick in terms of time. Um, probably done in a couple of months. And, and a, a big chunk of that was at, at the point that I submitted it, it was 115,000 words. Um, and the editor said he wanted to get it down to, well, wanted to get it down as much as he could, but like preferably within 100,000. So there were some quite major cuts to be made. Um, cuts and a couple of rewrites. We lost a couple of chapters as well, and I wrote. <laughs> ones. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was like quite a full on editing process. Um, I think my takeaway from that both both aspects were really good working with my editor was really good and working with my brother was really good but I was doing them alongside one another which was nightmarish um and I wouldn't <laughs> do that again because it you know that sometimes they say different things or they'd say the same thing but you know or or yeah and I'd have to I'd suddenly have a idea a new idea based on something that my brother has had and then have to kind of explain that to my editor but I didn't also want to say like Oh no, my brother told me that I have to cut those three paragraphs. So that's what I tried. <laughs> so all of this stuff. So it was a yeah, it was a it was a funny negotiation process. Um, I feel like there has been parts of that that I haven't. Let me let me find question. Um, what sort of things do I just want to start to that needed adjustment? So something I think my biggest takeaway from being edited by Jack at his Corralbo, which really I appreciated was that um, I think in its original formation formulation that the um, essays often had a much more um, they were tied together at the end much more cleanly and neatly and often more with some more sentimentality I suppose and he was a big fan of the quite kind of sudden ending he was like mm -hmm. you know at some point he said to me like you don't need to walk the reader through this so like you don't have to bring everything you don't have to tie everything together so neatly basically you know you you can hint at things and the reader, reader will get that and, and often that can be a lot more emotionally powerful than drawing every single last thing out um, and I think that for me has been a real a really important takeaway um you know I think um in a way that sort of lingers from from school probably writing essays at school that you know everything has to have this like no I don't think it was ever really sappy exactly but certainly like <laughs> some, it more of a like sentimental Ring, which I'm really glad that it doesn't have now. Um, yeah. Thank you. Really Very interesting.
Yeah, um, this this goes along with um, Emily just asked in the chat going along with what you just said, was there anything that had to be cut that you were really sad that had to be cut? I mean, you were happy to lose the sentimentality as you just explained, but was there anything that you had to cut that you really wished that you could have kept? I don't think I had to cut anything. Um, like, you know, it was ultimately this, and this is a nice thing about being an author rather than a translator, which <laughs> um, is that, you know, ultimately it was my say. And I, like, I could push back on things. Um, but, so there was nothing that had to go. I think there were a couple of things we had, like, he was quite firm about. Like, mm -hmm. I really is better without and and there are maybe a couple that I didn't fully agree with but I I don't think yeah I don't think I feel desperately sad about any of them because it's mostly just you know a sentence here and there okay okay um Angela asks why 50 what is the significance of 50 how did you come to 50 well 50 is Bojuon right um so it's a direct translation of Bourdieu and um and I understand that like that is quite tenuous in application to you know it would be different if it was ordered in like at you or but like it's it's slightly tenuous in application to kind of 50 onomatopoeic exams but I I sort of like that tenuousness and the sort of the playfulness of it in a way as well. Hmm. Nice. Okay, there are some really great book suggestions too in the chat. So everybody do take note, uh, save your chats so that you can refer back to them later. I think I have my summer reading list figured out just by looking at this. Um, we do have, Angela has also given us an onomatopoeia or actually a mimetic word, goro goro, she says. Uh, she, was, she asked her Japanese husband for a sound and he looked at the cat asleep on the chair and replied, goro goro. So um, it might be time to ask others too, if you have an onomatopoeia that you would like to share. Um, while you're thinking about that or possibly putting them in the chat, uh, there is also a question from Richard and he wants to know if you are an Anne Rice fan or do you just like fangs? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not an Anne Rice fan, but I do. <laughs> I do like, I am a vampire fan, I would say. I do like, I do like things. Um, my friend actually had this necklace and I was sort of obsessed with it. And then when I left Japan, I said to him, do you mind if I get the same one? He's like, no, it's fine. We're in different countries now. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, we have another onomatopoeia. This is great. Okay, so Beatrix writes, uh, you were able to zubarito, finish your chapters and were thereby getting straight to the point and making the reader think on her or his own. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, thank you, Beatrix. Nun, nun. Thank you, Victoria. Do you want to say anything about that one? No, just that, I don't know. It's just fun and positive, and actually, there's a. It's the name of a snack, a bar in Malka, the town next where I live. And so, when I drive past, you know, I've never been there. I just drive past it, and but when I see it, nun, nun, I think, yeah, I'm feeling pretty nun, nun today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all. Yeah, that's a fun one. I like that. The context of a snack as well. <laughs> Avery, you have mushy mushy. How did it come out when you translated it? She said she loved the 50 sounds definition, but recently had to translate this for children. So it came out differently. Avery, how did you translate it? Just put in the chat if you remember how you translated it. We're all on pins and needles now wondering. I would like to say that I really love your koro koro. The sound of your teeny little identity makes it go spinning across the floor. I love that. Um, <laughs> When you've lived in, in Japan for many years as a foreigner and you are trying to figure out who you are at different stages, that, that sort of captures it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Avery wrote, I like being steamed alive, but had to do sticky, hot, etc. 
Yeah, steamed alive is pretty visceral. Maybe not, maybe not quite what they were going for in children's literature. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Hi Jillian. Hi. I'm I'm reading um Fushigi Dagashiya. Uh, there's only ten dogs. Um, <laughs> um so it's not really uh, onomatopoeia, but it's more Dajara Kotobasobi, I guess, a pun. They're talking about all these strange, interesting, unusual, amazing sweets in this Fushigi Dagashiya mysterious sweet shop. And they have Mafia Adino Don Chocolone. I just thought that was really clever. It's not really on the matter pay, but it's some. Um, I liked it. Mafia Adino Don Chocolone. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Um, Beverly, Beverly, you have Kira Kira and Gira Gira. How twinkling becomes oppressive dazzle. Would you like to say anything more about that one, Beverly? No, just that, you know, the change from the ka to ga and the, I guess I'm still on my spectrum thing, but it, it just, uh, you know, completely, it, it sends something from, as I say, twinkling to the kind of glaring sun that we get. And it, it's so economical and still holds the one idea as well as the other. And those are words I really like. That's great. Anyone else? Do we have more time for questions? Susan? I think we do. Sure. So I just wanted to ask, Polly, you're doing both literary and nonfiction translation. Are you like for literature? I presume you have some choice in, in what you do. But for nonfiction, which I'm most interested in, are you particularly attracted to a particular subject um, that you hope you can work more in? Well, I do, at the moment, I do a lot of um, art related. Mm. So I do a lot of work for, for kind of um, essays for exhibition catalogues and, you know, panels. Um, oh, great. Exhibitions and so on and so forth. And that, like, is a funny one because I, like, I love it. I love doing yeah. that. But it sort of, it, it's, you know, such a small world and, and it just the kind of gradually, like, I get introduced to more and more and more people. So like the, the demand for that kind of, I don't go looking for it anymore at all. Like it, yeah. it just comes to me. And so that's like quite a nice steady flow. I mean, I, I am interested in doing other kinds of non-fiction and occasionally that, like that comes to me, but I, I suppose that the easiest thing is just to keep on going with the art, you know? Is it uh, traditional art or modern art or both or? Kind of a mix actually. It's yeah, kind of a mix, sort of whatever is on at those particular art museums that I that I work with mostly. Because um, there is a, a big need for good art translators. Um, yeah, and and I feel like good essays about art are really fascinating, you know, and and sort of over often quite literary in style, or you know, engage with really interesting kind of critical theory and so yeah it's 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 really it's really interesting for me to do that. and also challenge you is for your research skills too so yeah keep yeah yeah um, and also so in your nonfiction translation what are the kinds of things that you try to really pursue or what are your one thing i think i wanted to mention you mentioned one part of your uh, book you mentioned that you think translation should be a form of activism mm -hmm. and I was quite fascinated by that because I myself feel that way in a, in a sense and I'm very glad to hear that <laughs> so you have a sense of a kind of mission that you have um, to communicate right yeah and I think also I mean particularly within the context of literary fiction but not not necessarily just literature like it is about, like you say, like it is about the act of choosing, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, we are in a place where, I mean, choosing and also championing, because we are in a place where certain voices routinely make it over into English and others don't. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, stepping in as a translator and, and saying like, okay, I, I don't want to translate that because, I, you know, I, I don't feel like 
that's appropriate to be translated or it doesn't speak to me. Whereas, you know, I feel like this more underrepresented voice needs to be heard more like that for me. I mean, it's, it's very, when you say it like that, it sounds very, um, very basic and, and very nothing you, but I think, and I'm also privileged, right? Because, you know, not all of us can make those sorts of choices. Like sometimes you just need to make enough money to live and you kind of need to take whatever work comes your way, right? So I, I'm, I'm not kind of casting judgment on anyone who doesn't do that. But I think once I got to the stage where I felt like I had enough work that I could choose, I, I, I've stopped. Yeah, I stopped working on, on books that I feel like I'd rather not see in English. So, <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Thanks. This is not quite related to that, but I'm curious. I think that there's a fascination um, in Japan amongst Japanese audiences, Japanese readers, with how foreigners see Japan. How do, how do we see Japan? How do we experience Japan? And do you think that there would be any market for your book translated to Japanese? It's a really good question. I mean, I, I, I can't help thinking with my translator brain of like just how difficult it would be to translate into Japanese and how hard to get right. I mean, how fun. It's easier to translate into almost any other language than Japanese, right? And I think for that reason, I sort of don't want it to be, really. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a funny one. Also, also I, I don't think that it's hugely critical of Japan, but I think it's not the typical kind of nonfiction book that is published about Japan by Westerners is more keeping praise. Right. And I think that for that reason alone, it potentially could be not shocking, but like maybe perceived as more critical than it would read to an English reader. I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. that's just, that's possibly. Just... Yeah, possibly. They might also take issue with your unique translations of some of the onomatopoeia. Yeah. Yeah. It would be like, oh no, she didn't get that at all. That's not, that, that's not right. <laughs> I could see that kind of reaction happening. Oh, thank Yeah. Emily, thank you for your comment. I leave it to you to come up with the most obscure, <laughs> obscure onomatopoeia. That's a good one though, right? DVD? I've never heard this. Yeah, never. He, I, he's known for coining it. So oh. if you ever want to talk about the sound of drinking Coke out of a can. <laughs> I'm writing. I'm writing this one down. Okay, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> like, is that, is that like a, a sip rather than a kind of glug, right? That's a kind of... I think it's just jibiri tononda, so I'm not entirely <laughs> sure. <laughs> but... Doesn't yeah, it sound like, like Just the... a quick, you know, taking a drink out of a can, I think. Yeah, it sounds more like a... To me than a like mm, we should we should ask him <laughs> and the fe the feeling of the carbonation you know yeah. in that sip that's yeah. what I, that's what i see and that's that. what i like about it so much. yeah can i say something here i i just wanted i have this line the only one line in the, i i'm reading this on kindle by the way which i don't normally do um, but this whole conversation is something that really made me feel good at the end of the book. By the way, I, I didn't have time to read everything and I missed like all the sex parts apparently. So I have to go back and do those chapters. <laughs> but what I wanted to say is like the parts where, where I, I think a lot of us probably felt like explaining what you do as a translator or actually being a translator is not well accepted a lot of times. And in the very last part, you said this, you said, you were talking about describing the gorilla, how a gorilla sounds. And now you're talking about how a sip of cola sounds. You say, this indulgent attention is the birthplace of all the good stuff. And I love that line. It's like, yeah, we spend time on the teeny little things that make it really good in the end. So I really, I'm going to keep that line. <laughs> Thank you. That's really nice to hear. Um, yeah, but like, it, I, like, it is when an author is put 
all of that thought into something like that's when you that's when the joy of being a reader comes right when it is something like jibbity or whatever it's like that you kind of feel the thrill of that there's another author another Japanese author who's really famous for making up lots of yongo it's gone totally to my mind but it'll come to me I found when I was researching this I found a quiz like talking about his idiosyncratic usage of them and like seeing this was for native Japanese speakers, like seeing if you could guess what what it what this particular one meant. All right. Well, we are just about out of time, but I would like to say thank you to Polly for sparing us two hours of your time today. Thank you so much for joining us. It was truly a pleasure to read your book, and I love your translations as well. So keep it up. You have a fan club here in Japan. Emily, thank you so much for organizing and asking the Hi. erudite questions and yeah thank you so much thank you first of all i'd like to really thank polly for giving us this wonderful in-depth discussion and for her positive and cheerful attitude towards translation which we really need more of <laughs> the uh, verve and willingness to grow into it and the positive uh, embrace of such a difficult language which uh, sometimes gets a lot of sort of angst and <laughs> toil and yet all of us have survived and we've enjoyed it and we're still here so we hope that you will be with us too and sweat is very much a organization of people who do as you write edit and translate so we hope that you will keep hooked into our network and we will see you here in japan most of us I guess, happen to be here. Yeah. The official meeting is over and I'm going to stop recording at this point. <laughs>